Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Byington, and in this video, we're going to be talking about Percy Shelley's poem, Mont Blanc. And in this particular video, I'm only talking about the poem. If you go back to my Ozymandias video by Percy Shelley, I talk about the poet's biography there. So to begin with Mont Blanc, this poem is one of the more challenging poems you will read in my Britlet 2 class. And Tell, of course, you get to uh, things like the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Uh, the main idea you want to understand about this poem, about Mont Blanc, is that this is a combination of our perception, our imagination, and the understanding of nature and its influence around us. And at what point human knowledge does and does not or can and cannot comprehend the world around us. So this poem was originally the conclusion to a um, book that was written by Percy Shelley and his wife, Mar uh, Mary Shelley, um, about a six week excursion <clears throat> in which they went to the valley at the the base of Mont Blanc in France. Uh, this little village is called Chamonix, and that is spelled differently in your text. In the sort of subtitle you have after Mont Blanc, it says lines written in the Vale of Chamonix, and it's spelled a little differently, but it is the same place. Uh, also, Mary Shelley's stepsister, Claire Claremont, was with them, but um, Mary, Sh Mary and Percy Shelley considered the authors of that um, observations and comments on their travels. This poem as the conclusion is essentially Percy Shelley's response to seeing Mont Blanc. Now I'm saying it with the proper uh, French pronunciation, which you don't pronounce the last letter of each word. You can say Mount Blanc if you prefer, whatever's easiest for you, but the pronunciation of the place itself would be Mont Blanc. And so anyhow, this particular mountain, why is it such a big deal? So it is the largest mountain, the highest mountain in the Alps and also the highest mountain in all of Europe. So it's a it's a big deal. It's a major tourist spot. I will take you to Google Maps in a moment to look at that area. Uh, this is also the poem is also, uh, as the Norton Anthology tells us, a sort of response to this idea about the beginnings of geology uh, when it's kind of first becoming identified as a science in and of itself. In the same week that Percy Shelley writes Mont Blanc, he also writes a letter to someone discussing uh, these views from the Count de, Count de Buffon, who was uh, considered a pioneer in geology, what was becoming geology, I should say, at that time, who comments on nature being this thing that doesn't work to our, and does it, it doesn't necessarily work to our advantage or in our favor. Um, it is sort of alien to us, as the language the Norton Anthology uses. It's indifferent to our needs. And this is part of that whole idea of the timeline of geology and the formations of mountain ranges and other landmarks around the world, natural landmarks around the world, whether we're talking about bodies of water or whatever. We our our human knowledge cannot even possibly comprehend all that needed to take place for those things to form and take shape over time on that particular time scale of like the millions of years kind of time scale because our existence as human beings is so minute compared to that of uh, things like mountains and rivers uh, we, we are just a beep, just a little blip on the time scale of the rest of earth more or less so 
what's so fascinating about it is say like, of course, going and seeing a natural landscape like Mont Blanc, uh, it can be breathtaking, um, even somewhere local, uh, nearby uh, ETS, you hear something like the Blue Ridge uh, Mountains to see that landscape. If you get on the inter interstate from the university and you're heading towards the North Carolina border, sometimes when you're coming around some of the curves and you just suddenly see that massive landscape of mountains, it's it, you feel so small. And it's this vastness that the poem that this poem is talking to it's talking to that type of vastness where it seems as if it could nearly consume your existence this is like you are the little ant traveling down the interstate among these, this massive landscape that has been there for far far longer than humanity not even just you just all of human life in general let me go ahead and go to the Google map version here so I can uh, kind of give you a visual of what's going on. So let me back all the way out first, just to give you some perspective. So this video is for a class at East Tennessee State University. So here we are over there. And then if we jump all the way over here to Europe, this particular place is uh, right kind of in the nook of eastern France, western Italy, uh, southwestern Switzerland. The Chamonix is right here. You see outlined Mont Blanc is uh, the peak of it is identified right there. So I'm going to go all the way down into this valley the town of Chamonix. Now, uh, you also have a footnote in the Norton Anthology that says Percy Shelley's response to seeing Mont Blanc is um, he, he has this experience about the, the this aesthetic rapture of experiencing nature, of seeing Mont Blanc by uh, standing on a bridge on the River Arve he refers to it in the poem as um, Ravine of Ar. And so that is going right here through Chamonix. So you can see that in the larger scope of things, I know it's not right, right up on it, but this is the largest mountain in Europe. So you have to understand that this might seem like it's a distance away, but it's the mountain is so incredibly, massive that to be here at this valley it's all you see it's it, it's what you see uh forever when you look up so let me go to where i can give you some actual images when i hover over so stereotypical kind of top of the mountain view And also, there's something else, back up just a little bit, there's something else as well around Chamonix that uh, is referenced in a footnote in your poem, the Mer de Glace, that's the glacier that's uh, feeding and forming the river, uh, river Arve, the ravine of Arve. I lost my place. I just found it. Sorry. Okay. So the Mer de Glass, all of that is right over here to the e immediately east of Chamonix. So that is referenced as well. So all of this landscape exists in this poem forever. Uh, that comes up. This was mentioned in the video for Percy Shelley's poem, Ozymandias how uh, a piece of art, the narrative in it, the content in it lives forever. The page is alive, but the author is dead. So this experience, so Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley and her stepsister, Claire Claremont, is 
forever sort of immortalized and at this place it, it's its moment in time even though nature's existence is far larger than humanity's this is also on the in that same way immortalized in that moment of percy shelley being on the bridge over the ravine of argive and seeing all of this landscape just the same way that the statue of Ozymandias in that respective poem captured and sort of immortalizes Ozymandias. So going back. All right, so going back into your PowerPoint, I'm now uh, moving along. Another major thing you need to understand to grasp this poem and the things it's talking about, especially when we are seeing the reference to the universe of things uh, that is in your opening line and it comes up again in part two. You probably noticed that the poem is uh, a little lengthy. It's broken into five sections. So sometimes you might have a poem that is fairly lengthy like this and it does not use those numbers, uh, whether uh, it, it's marking it with numbers or uh, naming it as a, a sort of subsection in some other sort of way that they're taking artistic liberties about. You just think of that as like another scene in the act, the way that act one in a play might have, it might be act one, scene two, act one, scene three, and so on and so on. So you might think of this poem uh, functioning in a similar way. We start with act one, scene one, with that opening line, the everlasting universe of things. And as the idea that Percy Shelley is trying to express or that he's trying to articulate by what he has seen in this moment of aesthetic rapture of seeing the highest mountain in Europe and seeing the Alps is it's changing, it's evolving in each little chapter or scene as we move on in scene two, in scene three, in scene four, which whichever you want to point to. Uh, this whole main philosophy that you want to make an effort to understand is Plato's theory of perspective. This is called the allegory of the cave. And just to give you a very, very watered down version, this is sort of like, imagine you have two prisoners in a cave. They are bound in the cave. They can't turn around and look anywhere else. They are facing a wall. And let's say there's some sort of light source in the traditional sense that's um, it's created by a fire. But just say there's some sort of light, so a light source that is illuminating the wall the two prisoners are looking at and things walk by in front of the light source but behind the prisoners so the prisoners never see the real thing and just um to keep it light because it is a com complex philosophical idea let's say it's a cat let's say a cat walks in front of the light source but it's walking behind the prisoners so all the prisoners have ever seen is the shadow of the cat on the wall. They have a rough idea of its shape, but sort of not really its size because like shadows is not always the same, right? Depending on the distance of the light and the thing itself. Let's say one day one of the prisoners gets free and they can turn around and all of a sudden they see that thing that was making the shadow on the wall they thought they knew what that thing was all along, that it was just that particular shape of shadow. But now, all of a sudden, they can see, let's say it's really bright, a really bright light source, like daylight. If, if you've ever been somewhere inside all day, like um, a, let's say you go see a movie in the middle of the day, and it's dark inside the cinema, right? You go back out of the matinee and it's so bright it almost hurts to look around at first because your eyes have to adjust same thing here if the prisoner 
randomly got free one day and now they can turn around and look elsewhere the light source is probably making it difficult for them to see clearly at first they have to adjust to seeing all this new visual information and that thing the cat or they thought they knew the shadow the shape on the wall all along now they see that it's so much more than just a shadow that cats can be all sorts of colors. They can be orange or gray or black, or they, they can be black and white or gray and white or an orange and white and so on and so on. And the other finer details, like they couldn't, the prisoner previously couldn't see in the shadow that it has whiskers or that, or what the shape of its face looks like or the color of its eyes. So it's just layers and layers and layers of more detail. So you understand what that thing is on a deeper and deeper level. That's what Percy Shelley is playing on in Mont Blanc. He is saying how this nature is informing a type of truth in his understanding of his own existence, his personal existence. And so that's where uh, we are going with the reference to this universe of things. The universe of things becomes conflated with the river because there, it's not just the everlasting universe of things. It's the everlasting universe of things flows through the mind, rolls its rapid waves. So things that flow and have waves, this is, these are words we would connotate with bodies of water. So this long, long history that nature has had, specifically natural natural forms in nature like mountains and rivers. So Mont Blanc and uh, the ravine of Arve, the river Arve. So it is part of this perception of life. There's a lot of existentialism here, like wondering what one's place in life is. What is one's place in all of existence? What's the meaning of life? It starts boiling down to those sorts of questions. So the, the poem and its conflation of nature and existence, uh, the conflation of perception and these natural forms in the landscape. It leads us into the very end in section five, after we're reading about his questioning of existence and uh, the gleams of understanding that we get through sleep and death that he suggests. In the very end, he is asking about the silence and solitude if to the human mind's imagining silence and solitude were vacancy in this everlasting universe of things which flows through the mind if it's like Mont Blanc and earth and stars and and the ocean if it's if those two things are the same when we look at an incredible landscape like that and feel some sort of tinge of inspiration, even if you, you are totally not into writing, I don't want to paint the landscape. It just sends a nice, it gives you a nice feeling inside to experience it, to see it. It's pretty. We call that aesthetic rapture. That's what I mean when I've been saying aesthetic rapture. So he is asking, does what happens first? This is a chicken or the egg situation. Does the nature inspire us? Is the poet, in this case, Percy Shelley, this feeling, is the poet feeling inspired by nature or like the experience itself? Or is it the human perception of seeing it and knowing the context of it, how old it is or how famous it is, 
that inspires the awe of uh, of witnessing it firsthand. So is it nature shaping the art or is it the human the humanness in us wanting to find some value or meaning in seeing that thing is it is it some piece of human knowledge like the geology of knowing how old the mountain is and what it took for millions of years to shape that for it to be what it is is it that so that is all for this video. Thank you for watching.